Let us pray. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. And bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Sadness and success. Two things that it seemed like if you had one, you didn't have the other, that if you had success, you didn't have sadness, or if you had sadness, you must not have success. But sadness and success can grow together. A lot of people see that. The, the further they get and advance in a career, the more sad they get. The, the, the less fulfilled they might feel. And the more money they have, the more they might realize that that money has not given them any kind of happiness. And so there's a deeper sadness that even comes after you have great success and you find that it does not fulfill Busyness and time-saving devices have a similar kind of relationship. If we are so busy, you would see, think that the more time-saving devices you would have, the, the less busy you would become. You, like you would have more time because uh, there are these machines that are doing things for you. Uh, so that uh, before, if you had to wash your clothes by hand, that would take so much time. But now you throw it in, you dump in some uh, liquid and you'd hit the buttons and you walk away. But as we have seen, these last couple decades especially, as, as time-saving devices uh, have increased exponentially, we have not become less busy. We seem to be busier than ever. We are frantic, barely getting everything into our schedules, and getting everything done. Sadness and success can both increase together and busyness and time-saving devices can both increase together and, and they will increase if we are lacking contentment, if we are not happy with the blessings that God has given to us, if we're not happy with the work that we have to do, with the station that we have in life, with the, our callings to be what God has called us to be and love whom God has called us to love, if we are not happy with that, then no amount of success would drive away sadness. Then no amount of time-saving devices would keep us from being frantically busy trying to, to work our way away from where we are. Can a lack of contentment can drive us crazy. It can make us worried and upset about many things. As they went on their way, Jesus came into a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who was sitting at the Lord's feet and was listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her serving. She came over and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. The Lord answered and told her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is needed. In fact, Mary has chosen that better part, which will not 
be taken away from her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mary has this contentment and she sits at the feet of Jesus and listens to his teaching. She has recognized the only thing that is needful, the one thing that is needed, the thing that cannot be taken away, that will not be taken away from her. She has chosen Jesus, the word made flesh. She has chosen his word. She has chosen to give her ears to his mouth. She has seen that there is nothing better. Martha, on the other hand, is not content. You see in this painting by Vermeer, she's up above Jesus. She scolds him in a way. Why don't you tell my sister to, to help me? I'm the only one doing any work around here. But you see how silly this is and how silly we are sometimes. When we complain about how busy we are, sometimes we need to stop and, and take a look and say, well, we volunteered for all of this stuff. We don't have to do all of it. <laughs> we don't have to be all of this busy, all this busy. Uh, we don't have to have our kids signed up for everything. We don't have to have their schedules jam-packed. We don't have to do this. And, and Martha chose to do this. She invited Jesus into her house. She decided to, to take care of the meal. She could have been content with that. She could have been content with taking care of all of the preparation on her own. And you know what she could have been doing while she was preparing the meal? She also could have been doing what Mary was doing. It's a wonderful thing about word. You can take word in while you're doing all sorts of stuff with your hands. And we do that all the time. That's why uh, people get uh, earbuds uh, and the, uh, get the, the right ones that will stay in their ears so they can listen to something while they're doing something else with their body, whether it's, it's running or, or mowing the lawn or, or driving a tractor uh, or doing the dishes. You can take word in and meditate on it while you're doing something with your hands. And Martha could have done that. Now she did do some meditation. Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. And worry is a form of meditation. It's taking something in your brain, a, a thought that, that makes you upset, and chewing on that again and again in your brain, and mulling that over again and again in your brain. Uh, it's mulling uh, over something that is making you miserable and upset. That's what worry is. It is a form of meditation. You're meditating on something that is awful, though, that makes you upset. Martha could have been meditating on what Jesus was saying. And the houses at that time weren't all that huge. It was not like she was a few hallways down uh, and a bunch of rooms separated away from where Jesus was teaching. Uh, they were likely all in the same room uh, as it was likely a one-room household. <laughs> uh, and the preparations were done in one corner and Jesus was sitting in the other. She certainly could have heard what Jesus was saying and she could have been meditating on that. She could have chosen to mull over in her mind and in her heart the one thing that is needed the thing that will not be taken away from her, the thing that gives contentment. Because when we have this one thing that is needful, when we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all the other things fall into place. They have their, their proper uh, order. And everything gets put in its right perspective. And things like worry, 
or driven away. Because we can be content like Mary, not up above Jesus telling him the way things ought to be, but down beneath him as a student, eager to have the ears filled with the words that come from his mouth. This is one of the main reasons that we come to, to church on Sunday. It's to sit at the feet of Jesus and to be underneath him and to have our ears open to receive the words that come from him. Words that, that are there in, in the readings. As we've talked about in this uh, course, the, the word of God is all over in song and in the responses that we say that the word of God is scattered all throughout uh, the liturgy. But then we also have uh, particular readings, uh, very often one from the Old Testament, one from uh, what we call an, an epistle or a letter uh, in the New Testament, and then one from uh, the one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And one of the responses that we say after hearing the word of God, the pastor says, the word of the Lord, the congregation responds with great joy and gusto, thanks be to God. You see, that's the Mary response. Uh, not Martha standing up above Jesus and saying, well, well I don't really like what you said there. Or, or it should have been different. What you should have said was, Mary, uh, what's wrong with you being so lazy and not helping your sister out? And when we hear the word of God in church on Sunday, when we hear these lessons read from uh, throughout the, the, the Holy Scriptures, uh, we want to have this, this Mary response. But we have a sinful nature. And our sinful nature is never happy with the word of God, never content with the word of God. It does not want to say, thanks be to God, in response to the word of the Lord. It wants to fight against it. It wants to say, is that really the way it is? Well, I don't think that's the, uh, all that true. Uh, or I don't want to hear it. Or uh, instead of uh, thinking, well, that's something for me, uh, sometimes we think, well, I know someone who really needs to hear this. Uh, and we start thinking about that person in the pew in front of us. And we think, well, I'm so glad uh, that that person was here because they're awful <laughs> and they needed to hear this word of the Lord. Uh, that sinful nature needs to be fought against in church. And that's why we say this, this response. It's not just a, a neat, tidy way to finish up one lesson and move on to the next thing. Uh, no, uh, there's an opportunity here. Uh, when the pastor says the word of the Lord, uh, your sinful nature can take over and say, I don't like it. Or your sinful nature can be put down and fought against. And you can say with gusto and joy, thanks be to God even if and especially when it is a lesson from scripture that is difficult to accept. And sometimes when you, you finish a, a, a reading uh, a, a, on a Sunday morning uh, and the, the last few verses are strict law and curses, you know, I, and then you follow that up with the word of the Lord and it's not so much with great gusto that we say, thanks be to God. Uh, because some, there are some things in the word of God that are tough. And it is especially at that time when this response is helpful. Uh, that we fight against our own sinful nature that hates the word of the Lord. And we say, no, nevertheless, even if my sinful nature has a bunch of reasons why uh, we don't want to listen to this. Nevertheless, we say, thanks be to God. We sit there at the feet uh, of Jesus alongside of Mary. And we say, thanks be to God, to every bit of the word of the Lord. And this brings contentment. 
And to have this one thing needful, it allows us to be content and not worried and upset. The opposite of, of contentment, it would be coveting. And the ninth and 10th commandments uh, talk about coveting. In the ninth commandment, uh, we read, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. From the small catechism, we have this explanation. We should fear and love God so that we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house or get it in a way which only appears right, but help and be of service to him in keeping it. So, so to covet something is to want something that God has not given to you and has not given you a, a way to, to get in an honest way. So let's say as, as an example, if I pull into my driveway one evening and I look into my neighbor's driveway and all of a sudden uh, I, I notice something that wasn't there before, it's a brand new shiny boat. And I think, oh, that's not fair. I want that boat. That guy, my neighbor, he doesn't work nearly as hard as I do, and I still can't afford a boat. It's not fair. I want that boat. That would be, that would be coveting, I'm desiring something that's not mine, and that I don't have a, an honest way of of, achieve, of getting. Now, if I pulled into uh, my uh, driveway, say three months later, and that same boat is there, and now it has a sign on it, and the sign says, for sale. Then I might think, well, there's, there's an honest way that I could get that boat. Uh, and then there would be another question, though. Can I afford it? If I can't afford it, uh, then I I don't need to, to pine away and sulk about how it's not fair. I never get to have a boat. When am I going to get to have a boat? This is not fair. That would be, that would also be coveting. And it's just the opposite of contentment. To be content is to be content with what God has given you and to be content with what God has not given you. To be content that your neighbor has a boat and you don't. Even if that means that your neighbors will always have boats and you will never have one. Contentment comes from hearing the word of God. And when it comes to our neighbor's boats and our lack of boats, it comes to, to listening to what God has to say about every good and perfect gift uh, about who's in control. And if, and if he's guiding all things in such a way that there's just no way that I ever get to own a boat, well, to God be the glory. He knows what he's doing. He's God and I'm not. And you look to a, a, a book like Job, and if you're thinking about contentment, and you'd step away from you know, the silliness of you know your neighbor having a boat. And you think about what Job went through and what he lost. Everything. His children. His health. All he had was broken pottery to, to scratch himself with. And a wife, a wife who gave no comfort but said, Why don't you just curse God and die? And yet Job is able to speak this beautiful word of contentment. The Lord gives. The Lord takes away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And also, the beautiful Easter uh, word from Job. I know that my Redeemer lives. And that in the end, he will stand upon the earth. And I will see him. With my own eyes, I might will see him. Even after my skin has been destroyed, I myself will see him with my own eyes. I will see my Redeemer. How my heart yearns within me. <laughs> In that way, contentment is not this, this giving up sort of attitude. It's, it's I am content because I have Christ. And if I have Christ, 
I couldn't have possibly more. There's nothing better to desire than him. And it's not just a, a, a bland sort of desire. It's not a, a simple thing that we, we want when we want to have our Redeemer to be able to see him. There's nothing better than the one thing needful, who is the Word made flesh. The Tenth Commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. In the small catechism, we have this question and uh, the, the, the answer. What does this mean? And we should fear and love God so that we do not entice or force away our neighbor's wife, workers or animals or turn them against him, but urge them to stay and do their duty. And that last part is, is the part to kind of focus on. These two commandments are, are very similar. Uh, and in some uh, Christian traditions, they, they're put together uh, as the, just one commandment, the 10th commandment. Um, but the numbering of the commandments is not something we need to uh, quibble over too much. Um, but f for this commandment, that, that last part in the small catechism, but urge them to stay and do their duty. All of the commandments give us uh, negative things uh, that we're not supposed to do and, and positive things that we are supposed to do. Uh, so we're not supposed to, con uh, to, to covet, uh, to, to uh, pine and, and sulk when we see that our neighbor has uh, a boat and we don't have a boat and it's not fair because uh, that, especially since that coveting will lead to you know, saying nasty words about our neighbor uh, trying to drag his name through the mud, maybe even trying to steal the boat, uh, which if it's your neighbor's boat, it's probably not, uh, not a good, uh, not an easy thing to steal your neighbor's boat from his driveway and get it into your driveway. That's probably, you're probably not going to get away with that. Uh, but coveting will lead to, it's a, it's a seed kind of sin on the inside that will lead to all sorts of other sins on the outside. Now, the positive thing, the thing that we are to do, uh, is to urge uh, them to stay and do their duty. Uh, so if me as a pastor, uh, if as someone is a part of another flock, and they come to me and they say, well, I'm just not happy where I am. You know, the, the pastor that I have is, is messing this up and that up, and he has this style, and I don't like that style. Um, Part of my obedience to this commandment would be to say, well, you need to go talk to your pastor. You know, if he's not uh, preaching false doctrine, um, if he's giving you the gospel, if he's giving you Jesus, you need to be content with that, not upset because you don't like his mustache or you don't like the, what he wears during church or, or whatever. If he's giving you Jesus and you're not content with that, I tell, I tell you what, you're going to find something to complain about here, too. <laughs> well, you're not going to be content with anything. Uh, urging people to stay uh, is, is, a, is a very helpful thing. You see that with, with relationships, uh, with, with jobs. Uh, sometimes when, when people lack contentment, they'll end up bouncing from job to job, bouncing from girlfriend to girlfriend to girlfriend, uh, always chasing, never, never content. We can urge them to stay, to not constantly be running. But if we urge them to stay, we need to give them a good reason to be able to stay. And that, that's what we have in the one thing needful and that Mary is down there listening to. Uh, the good news of who Jesus is and what he has done. Jesus Christ loves you and you're going to see your Redeemer. You know, you have victory over death. You can be content even if your pastor is boring your, your job is not fulfilling. Uh, your, your girlfriend has some personality quirks <laughs> that annoy you a little bit. You don't have to constantly be running away because things are not perfect. 
you have Jesus, who is perfect and loves you perfectly and unconditionally. And because of that, you can be content with the imperfect people around you, the imperfect station in life that you have, the imperfect house that you have, uh, the driveway that lacks a boat. You can be content with that. If you seek the righteousness of God first and his kingdom and his righteousness, if you have Jesus, you can be content with a lot of things. Now, it's not to say that it's never a time, there's never a time to, uh, to quit your job or to end a relationship or, or to change churches, but uh, a lack of contentment over uh, the imperfections of other people and situations uh, is just going to lead to ever-increasing sadness as you bounce around from person to person, church to church, and job to job, and on and on. Um, there are times to leave, um, but not because people are just imperfect. The third commandment, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred, gladly hear and learn it. So this is the Mary attitude. This is the contentment attitude to realize that my Sabbath, my rest, comes in the word of God. So I want this to be held sacred. This is the thing. This is the big thing. This is the special thing. This is where I am close with God. Uh, this is where God comes to me and I am next to him. He's with me in a way that's different than just his omnipresence as he's everywhere uh, and he's close to everyone. And in his word, I have him with me in, in a different way. Uh, he's with me in his grace gracious toward me in his word. So this is the one thing needful, as Jesus calls it in Luke chapter 10, speaking about uh, what Mary chose, the, the better part. The scriptures are all about Jesus. Uh, Jesus said in John chapter 5, you search the scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them. They testify about me. If we're looking through the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, and trying to find what does this have to do with me instead of what does this have to do with Jesus, then we're starting off on the wrong foot. We're going in the wrong direction. Jesus gives us the key here uh, to how to look uh, at the scriptures. They testify about him. All of it is about him and pointing to him. In his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul wrote, Yes, Jews ask for signs, Greeks desire wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, which is offensive to Jews and foolishness to Greeks. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. We preach Christ crucified because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now, a lot of people talk about Jesus. Uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, has the, the name of Jesus uh, in uh, the, their name there, uh, but they don't believe in the Jesus of the Scriptures. And the Jesus of the Scriptures that Paul talks about here is Christ crucified. Uh, if we have a Jesus apart from the cross, then it's not the Jesus of the Bible. This word of God, uh, this word of the cross, of the crucified Christ, is what gives us life. Jesus said in John chapter 6, The Spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh does not help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit. They are life. You see, the word of God is life-giving. 
Uh, it points us to Jesus, who is life, as we saw in our very first lesson uh, of this course. Uh, Jesus is not uh, someone uh, who has lived a good life and has this big grand thing of life up above him, uh, the, the way it is for us. Uh, no, Jesus is life. Uh, and this word delivers his life. And so it's not just a teaching about him. Uh, it is, uh, it's not just information. It is vivifying. It gives, it delivers life to us. That vivifying point is something that uh, we'll kind of put a pin in here and come back to when we get to the, uh, the Lord's Supper. Um, but since Jesus is life and the word is all about him, uh, the word gives this wonderful gift of life. In the small catechism, uh, we talk about uh, Jesus Christ, uh, and uh, we have this explanation uh, to the second article uh, of the Apostles' Creed. And when we're talking about the Word, we're always talking about Jesus. Jesus said, these are the scriptures that testify about me. So if I want to understand the scriptures, here's, here's something that they're pointing to. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own, live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead lives and reigns to all eternity. And this word of God is uh, pointing us to Jesus, the crucified Lord, uh, the one who was crucified to give us life. And so it's different than, uh, say, the, the teaching of, uh, of uh, Buddhism. Uh, it's different than any other religion that's, that's giving, giving good advice, giving some information, giving some inspiration. Uh, the scriptures give all of that, advice, information, <laughs> inspiration, uh, to be sure. But more, they give life. They give us Jesus. In Romans chapter 10, uh, Paul wrote, So then how can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one about whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news of peace, who preach the gospel of good tidings. But not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who believed our message? So then, Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message comes through the word of Christ. Uh, we need a preacher, uh, as Paul says here in Romans 10. And we need a preacher who's preaching the good news of peace, uh, the gospel of good tidings. Uh, and this is the word of Christ. If I approach the scriptures looking for something other than Jesus, I'll find myself like Martha, worried and upset about many things, lacking contentment, coveting a, a different life uh, where these other people around me, like my lazy sister Mary, are doing the things that they're supposed to be doing. And I'll be worried and upset about many things. But if I and looking for what God is trying to give in his word, the gospel of peace, the, the, the gospel of good tidings, the word of Christ, the crucified one. Then be counted among those who are saved. The sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer and Jesus teaches us to pray and lead us not into temptation. In the small catechism, we have this question and answer. What does this mean? 
God tempts no one, but we pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature may not deceive us or mislead us into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. Although we are attacked by these things, we pray that we may finally overcome them and win the victory. Uh, I like how Luther uh, puts uh, false belief, uh, de the deception or being misled into false belief uh, out front. Uh, things like vice uh, at the end, uh, so uh, sins of uh, uh, adultery and things like that, uh, which are, are pretty obvious. Uh, most of the world can recognize these things are bad. Uh, those are things we don't want to be uh, falling into, to be sure. Um, but at, at the front of it, uh, the, the prime thing uh, is to be led away from the faith. And so when we approach God's word, we want to approach what gives faith. Faith comes through hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Uh, what we want to be listening for is not uh, so just some advice for how to not fall into sin, but for the message of Christ who died for all of us who will fall into sin every day of our lives <laughs> on this earth. Um, there's beautiful advice in the scriptures about not falling into sin, and we should listen for that as well. But the prime thing is that we have faith in Christ. So this message of the gospel is the thing that we want to be listening for. Otherwise, what we tend to do when it's just about behavior is do what Martha did and think about someone else's behavior. <laughs> and how Mary should be helping out and how that guy in the pew uh, ahead of me should be giving more money or whatever other nonsense or sinful nature wants to think about rather than thinking about the word of God during church. When we listen to the scriptures, we want to be listening for what gives us strengthening of our faith. It's the message of Christ. The word of God is powerful effective. It's there and it's powerful in uh, baptism. And so it, when we have the, the readings in scripture, uh, from scripture in the, the Sunday morning church service, that word of God that is read from the scriptures is not different uh, or something, uh, you know, other than the word of God uh, in baptism. Uh, when we think word and sacraments, uh, we shouldn't think uh, that the sacraments are devoid of the word. Uh, no, the word of God that we have written down in the scriptures uh, is powerful and effective. And the word of God that is spoken in baptism and attached to that word is powerful and effective. Uh, here's the, the way it, it, the small catechism talks about the word of God in baptism. And certainly not just water, but the word of God in and with the water uh, that does these things, along with the faith which trusts this word of God in the water. For without God's word, the water is plain water and no baptism. But the word of God, uh, but with the word of God, it is a baptism. That is a life-giving water. That's what the word does. It gives life, rich in grace, and a washing of the new birth in the Holy Spirit. St. Paul says in Titus chapter 3, He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. The word of God is powerful and effective. And, and when it's attached with water, then that makes the, the power of baptism. And so what we uh, try to do uh, in our church service uh, is to put the word of God all over the place. Uh, attach it to uh, symbols in the church building and colors in the liturgical year. Uh, we try to uh, have everything pointing to the word of God uh, because this is the powerful and effective thing. Now, in that last passage, uh, Paul uh, wrote that this is uh, trustworthy. Um, but how is the word of God trustworthy? It's a worthwhile question and a question that uh, we ought to, to think about. 
We should not just say, well, the word of God is the word of God because the word of God says it is the word of God. If someone says, well, how, do you, how can you trust the Bible? Uh, we can't just say, well, the Bible says that, that the Bible is trustworthy. Uh, in fact, the, the Bible itself doesn't want us uh, to think that way. Paul invites criticism. He invites a, a, a thorough investigation into these things. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote, And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is pointless, and your faith is pointless too. Uh, so right there, he opens the door. Uh, our faith and the word of God depend on a historical event that can be investigated. And if you investigate it and it's proven and that he has not been raised, then our preaching is pointless, your faith is pointless. Um, and then we are, as he continues, then we are even guilty of giving false testimony about God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise. If it were true that the dead are not raised, for if the dead are not raised, and not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. And then it also follows that those who fell asleep in Christ perished. If our hope in Christ applies only to this life, we are, to, we are the most pitiful people of all. This is something that separates Christianity from other religions. Uh, most other religions do not depend on historical accuracy. If Buddhism uh, does not have a historical Buddha that they can point back to, uh, then Buddhism can continue because it's just about the teaching. Same with uh, just about any other non-Christian religion. But Christianity is based in history. And so it invites that kind of historical scrutiny uh, that we should not uh, just ignore and say, oh, well, the Bible uh, tells me so, and so that's good enough for me. Um, good. That, that's not a bad attitude. Uh, that's kind of like a good Mary attitude. But if the Bible is good enough for me, and you have like this passage from Paul in 1 Corinthians, where he opens the door, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is pointless. Um, then it's also faithful for us as Christians uh, to investigate this uh, and to, to look into the history uh, of uh, the, the claims that uh, Christianity uh, makes. Um, we should have the attitude that uh, we trust the Bible. Um, and the, the exciting thing is that the Bible shows itself to be trustworthy. Uh, and the more that uh, archaeology unfold, uh, you know, uh, digs up. Uh, the the more uh, evidence we find, uh, the more and more it gets supported. Um, the the scriptures are, are like uh, no other book in ancient history, uh, and this course uh, that we're going through right now doesn't really give us the time to uh, dive into some of uh, those. Uh, uh, some of the bits of evidence that we can look at uh, the, and uh, explore how uh, accurate these claims are. Um, but I invite you to do that. Uh, and uh, there are some beautiful books uh, that have been written by people who set out to disprove Christianity and they went right for the jugular and they set out to prove that Christ has not been raised. Um, but at the end of it, they found that they became a Christian um, and that the historical accuracy of the Gospels uh, is uh, second to none uh, when it comes to uh, anything from the ancient world. Just a little bit. Uh, of that, how do the earliest copies of the Bible compare with other ancient writings? So if you want to investigate uh, the accuracy of the scripture, you should do it the way that you would uh, investigate the accuracy of anything uh, in uh, the ancient times. Uh, and the uh, earliest copies of the Bible 
uh, well, it just kind of blows out everything else uh, of, out of the water. Uh, there are 24,000 early copies of the New Testament, but only 643 copies of Homer's Iliad. Uh, but no one, no one really brings into question uh, or raises a big stink uh, about uh, Homer's Iliad. Um, and they shouldn't, uh, because it, it doesn't matter. Um, it, it, it's clearly a myth. Uh, and it doesn't matter if there was a person like Homer who even existed or if someone else wrote it and uh, attached the name Homer to it or something else like that. Um, but we have so many more copies uh, of the New Testament. And so there's, there's a lot of evidence to, uh, to take a look at. Uh, and the time between the completion of the New Testament and the earliest known copy of it is 225 years. For the Iliad, the get gap is 400 years. Uh, the earliest known manuscripts of Oedipus the King by Sophocles were written more than 1,400 years after his death. And the more and more you take a look at uh, the Bible compared with other ancient writings, uh, the evidence uh, for the support of uh, the Bible uh, it just outweighs anything else. Now, that's not enough. Uh, you know, a few sentences here uh, is not nearly enough uh, to, to look into uh, this uh, and to investigate the uh, accuracy of these uh, historic claims. Um, but this is the direction that it goes. Uh, history, an honest history, uh, and good archaeology, uh, uh, finding evidence in the, the Promised Land and in, in the Mediterranean areas where Paul went, finding evidence, uncovering stuff, some of the, is like the best friend of the scriptures. Uh, the more that has been uncovered, the more support there has been for the scriptures. Uh, and I would invite you to, to really take a deeper look into that. And uh, if I can do it right, I'll attach uh, a, a link uh, or two to, to some good books uh, that are a decent starting point in looking into that.